Welcome very much uh, to this panel discussion, um, which is focusing on educating uh, educating folks about about food, both in the community and in schools, and particularly um, educating children and youth. Um, so my name is Lisa Roberts. I'm uh, the moderator. Uh, no, I'm, I'm the moderator for this panel. Yes, I am. And I'm the executive director at Nourish Nova Scotia, which is a nonprofit charitable partner to uh, folks doing uh, food work in, uh, for children and youth um, in the school system and also, uh, uh, also in community. And I'm really uh, thrilled to have been invited um, to uh, moderate a discussion between these three good folks. Uh, and I'm going to mostly let them introduce themselves. I always find that I always like to start I always like to start when I'm talking by doing the introduction of myself that makes the most sense for the conversation I'm in and for the people that I'm in front of. So Lindsay, Rebecca, and Rachel are each going to start out by um, introducing themselves. Unfortunately, Edie Klee, who was also supposed to be with us, um, wasn't able to join us. So we have a little bit more time for each panelist, and hopefully we'll have some good time for, conver for conversation and questions afterwards. So I'm going to start by turning it over to Lindsay Corbin. Good morning. So my name is Lindsay, and uh, my role is uh, as coordinator for the Nova Scotia Coalition for Healthy School Food, which is housed within Nourish Nova Scotia. Uh, and most of my work is around advocacy. Uh, and so when I think about you know educating children and youth and, and the broader community about food, um, it, it's not, uh, it wasn't sort of like necessarily a natural fit for me to be on this panel at first until I really kind of thought it through, but I'll, that will make sense as I, as I talk. So Canada is currently the only G7 country without a federal investment in school food. Did anybody know that? Anybody not know that? People didn't know that. That's good. I'm, I like to teach people things. Um, <laughs> Uh, the Coalition for Healthy School Food has been formally advocating for some kind of a federal investment in healthy school food since 2014. Uh, and uh, we, one of our guiding principles, so the Coalition for Healthy School Food is nonpartisan. We're 200 plus um, nonprofit member organizations, about 100 endorsers. Uh, in every province and territory across uh, across Canada, and um, we don't sort of aim to prescribe a specific school food program. We what we do is we advocate for eight guiding principles, and one of those guiding principles is connected to food literacy. Um, so uh, w within uh, you know curriculum, formal curriculum, but also um, some less formal uh, food literacy activities. So I've just been thinking and reflecting. So I have two kids in school um, and just thinking, you know, about what are we currently teaching students and school communities about food? And when, and, and when I say that, I mean, what are we teaching them by what they're experiencing? So there's the teaching, obviously, that happens in the classroom, but there's also the teaching um, and the learning that happens through experiences. And so a few of the things that um, I know my kids are learning is that they need to eat quickly. They need to eat breaded chicken and pizza. Um, people who make and serve food. Um, so this is not necessarily what my children are learning, but the broader like system in the, the school community is, is learning that people who make and serve food are not valuable because they're either volunteers or they're highly underpaid. Um, and uh, my kids are definitely learning that you do not need to learn how to make or grow your own food. So I'm a product of this system. Um, so despite my career in nutrition, my husband has a, a career as a chef, um, we live in this society um, and we are a product of this system to a certain degree. So um, knowledge does not always equal behavior change, but policy change can certainly um, do a better job of changing behaviors. So again, my work is, is all around policy change. Um, it's a really exciting time, though, in school food. Um, so federally, uh, as of December 2021, there's two federal ministerial mandate letters 
that uh, the, the government of Canada, the Prime Minister, has tasked um, the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, as well as the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, to uh, work on a, a healthy school food policy um, for Canada and uh, explore how they can actually get more healthy food um, into, into schools. Uh, and there's currently, um, so and then in budget 2022, um, there, were, there was a paragraph in the budget um, basically reiterating this um, commitment. And right now, um, this month uh, was the start of some consultations, some round tables with a variety of different folks um, who touch different parts of this issue. Uh, and then there's also ongoing consultations with provincial and federal uh, governments, as well as First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Uh, so we're very hopeful that there will be the beginnings of a federal investment. What, what we've been advocating for is $1 billion over five years, which when you've been advocating for something for like 10 years and then inflation happens, we know that's not gonna go as far as it did would have 10 years ago, but it's still a start um, for a federal investment. Uh, and then provincially, uh, also very exciting here in Nova Scotia, um, our uh, Auditor General uh, report exposed the lack of adherence to our school food and nutrition policy in Nova Scotia. And um, the, uh, the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development have accepted all of 10 recommendations from the AG's report and have started to implement them. We also have a school healthy eating policy report that was put out by public health, which really um, gives us a picture of the systemic barriers to why, why they're not following the policy. Um, so uh, I am hopeful that uh, this uh, will lead to increased food literacy and uh, where, it, where we have a, a school food system uh, that has children excited to grow and prepare food, where food service workers are valued, um, where kids, are able, uh, kids and, and staff are able to eat mindfully and intuitively. Um, and uh, I, I said in the bio that I had to submit for this. I'm an eternal optimist, and I, I believe that by the time my kids graduate, Canada could have the best school food program in the world. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, Lindsay did introduce herself a little bit more. You mentioned that you're a nutritionist. You mentioned that you're that, that you're a mom. But Rebecca, feel free to feel free to elaborate a little bit more on your self introduction, or the full introductions of the panelists are also available online for every everyone. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so my name is Rebecca Suksom. I've been working for the Department of Agriculture um, based in Bible Hill for about 13 years, and I'm currently manager of regional programming, so responsible for a portfolio of programs, including the Agriculture in the Classroom program. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so Agriculture in the Classroom is uh, a, a movement, you could say, um, across Canada and, and in the United States as well. So in Canada, we are organized nationally through Agriculture in the Classroom Canada. There's a member organization for each of the 10 provinces. Um, we all sit on the board of directors. And as of September 2022, I'm chair of the board of directors of the national body. So in Nova Scotia, we uh, are a little bit of a standout. We're the only one of the provincial members that's a government department. Uh, the others are all not-for-profits. Um, so there's uh, strengths and, and weaknesses from being in government that I won't uh, elaborate on. But uh, um, yeah, so if you go onto the uh, Agriculture in the Classroom Canada website, you can find links to all the provincial organizations. Um, some of them have different names, but in the Atlantic region, we're all Agriculture in the Classroom Atlantic province, right? So Newfoundland, PEI, New Brunswick, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, sorry, New Brunswick, PEI, and then uh, Nova Scotia as well. So if you Google agriculture in the classroom, Nova Scotia, you would come up to our web page on our, our broader Department of Agriculture website. Um, so this network is great. It allows us to do some joint fundraising, uh, to share um, resources with each other, network and develop some national resources and programs as well. 
So our flagship resource is Canadian Agricultural Literacy Month in the month of March, where we encourage farmers and other agricultural professionals to visit classrooms in Nova Scotia. Our focus is on grade three. Uh, and to, to tell the students their farm story or their agricultural career story. So if you live in Nova Scotia or indeed any of the Atlantic provinces, because we all participate and you are not currently volunteering for Canadian Agricultural Literacy Month, I encourage you to contact your provincial organization and find out how you can help out. So that's my plug for, uh, for a national. Um, I guess I'll, I'll continue on and say, you know, wh why do we do the work we do? What are we passionate about? And uh, so we're really passionate about um, about food and agriculture, and we're passionate about, you know, making sure that we have a future where people continue to be able to access food and, and have food to eat. Uh, and, uh, you know, given the pressures of climate change um, and given the labor shortages that we're experiencing in many sectors across society, I would say that that's not a sure thing. So uh, we really take it as an important mission that, you know, for the survival of of people in the world uh, that we need to get kids excited about agriculture and agricultural careers. So that's uh, what drives the work we do. So in Nova Scotia, what does that look like? Um, we have a steering committee that's made up of uh, several representatives from different parts of the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development. Um, Lisa is on it, although we've not yet had a meeting since, uh, since she joined, so she's <laughs> I hope that wasn't a surprise to you, Lisa. That's no, okay. <laughs> Uh, as well as uh, Lauren Peters, who's here in the audience from the Dalhousie Agricultural Campus and representatives from the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture as well. Um, so that guides the work that we do. We're coming to the end of a four-year strategic plan, and I'm working on, on renewing it. But in this past strategic plan, uh, we we're very fortunate to have received an increase in resources, which doesn't happen that often. So our budget uh, for programming essentially tripled, and we also essentially tripled the number of staff that we had working on the program. So that was uh, tremendous and has really allowed us to grow the reach of the program. So um, previous to 2019, we had uh, focused a lot on in-person events, which were uh, you know, a great sort of one day out of school experience for the students. but. Uh, we, you know, we were limited in the number of students we could reach just by the geog geographic radius, um, and uh, the learning wasn't perhaps as well connected to curriculum outcomes as we might have liked, so we, we shifted our strategy a lot. We focus now on sending resources out to classrooms, that way there's no geographic limitation, um, and really starting with the curriculum uh, in terms of uh, deciding what the information looks like, so rather than thinking, am I out of time? No. Okay. <laughs> Rather than starting with, here's what we want students to know about agriculture, we start with a curriculum outcome. So we're really helping the teachers do their job and making it more likely that they'll, they'll use the resources that we're providing. So examples of some things that we've developed, um, we have a resource called Digging Deeper for grade seven and eight science students who are actually, <laughs> I, was, I was out on Wednesday digging up more soil. We have uh, soil from nine different <laughs> locations in the province um, that we put into little bags and send out to the classroom so they can run experiments on them. Uh, and they're learning about environmental stewardship, about uh, they have CO2 sensors in the school so they can learn about um, uh, soil respiration and carbon storage. Um, and how farming practices can, uh, you know, t store, cor store carbon from the atmosphere. Um, we have another grade seven, eight resource called uh, Pequimen Wild Blueberries in Mi'kma'ki and Wabanaki that talks about the importance of wild blueberries to uh, the Mi'kmaq people as one of the only crops that's native to Nova Scotia um, and how technolo technological changes in the 20th century have impacted the wild blueberry industry as well as uh, research that's happening at the Dalhousie Agriculture Faculty to reduce the environmental impact of wild blueberry farming. Um, we have something for grade primary to three called All Kinds of Apples, where we're purchasing local apples for different varieties that we send out to the younger kids so they can taste test, compare and contrast, use their five senses. Uh, and most of our resources also include a video series where we highlight a local farm. So it's a, a virtual farm trip, um, so they're connecting what they're doing in the classroom with what conditions are like on farms. So that's our general approach. Uh, in the 2021-22 uh, fiscal year, which is an awkward way to measure, but that's how our funding runs, um, we reached 269 out of the roughly 380 schools in the province uh, and created over 33,000 le uh, student learning experiences. So the reach has grown tremendously and I'm really proud of the work that my team has done and uh, looking forward to the next five years of our strategic plan and building on the work that we're doing. 
I also want to highlight that we recognize that there are a number of communities in Nova Scotia that haven't been well represented in our agriculture community. And so we have some special events and resources to, to reach those groups. So an example of those is Grow Where You're Planted. This is an event for African Nova Scotian high school students at the Dalhousie Agricultural Campus uh, to talk about agricultural careers, research and technology, and post-secondary options. Um, yeah, so. Thank you, Rebecca. And, and again, you didn't spend any time introducing yourself, but you are also a farmer, correct? Uh, I have recently stopped farming, but yes, I, I had a small organic strawberry farm for several years. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm a physical education teacher by trade, worked in the school system, K-8, to for about 15 years. Then I'm from New Brunswick, so the movement came of um, community schools. So the head intended of the school board asked me if I wanted to get a job which would link the school, the community, and the families. So I was very involved in the community with my role as a physical education, so I told the head of the school where I said, you're telling me you're gonna pay me full time for what I do on the uh, evenings and weekend? He said, yes, you go ahead. So anyway, it was a very um, challenging uh, thing. I was very involved in my community, so it was a K-8, to so I had to link different people from the community to the school to do experiential learning. And throughout that process, we had different uh, projects and one of them was we had grade threes that wanted to do a recipe book. So I had somebody that used to come to the school. She was a, a dietitian, so she would come and then teach the kids about the the Canadian food guide. And then the next week they would have to put bring uh, recipes from home and then put their dietitian glasses and then switch their recipe around so it could be more make a healthy twist. And then we'd get into action and then cook the food. Anyway, it was a success story and I was the privilege to be teaching, doing this in a school where my two daughters were. So I was on the soccer field in the arena and hearing the, the rebound effect at home that kids were, parents were telling me, hey, my daughter was the, the queen of parfait. So she was doing parfait because we had done granola and stuff like that. So she was treating her whole family. So I saw the real impact. And at the same time, in the cafeteria, we had a multinational that was running the cafeteria. And then we had kids eating healthy stuff. Parents were like, well, my daughter or my son won't eat that. I was like, well, guess what? I was there and, you know, they got their hands into it and they ate it. So anyway, fast forward a couple years, I asked the school board, it was a small school, K-8, 152, if I could take over the school cafeteria with a phys ed degree, no career. And <laughs> so I said, well, uh, Rachel, there's lots of regulation, this and that. Yeah, a good interest, but maybe not now because somebody, it was somebody new at the administration. So, I, you know, it took me time to build my concept. So anyway, 2011, I got the red, car the white carpet that I could do whatever I wanted. So I took over one school cafeteria, just brought local uh, menus, got the kids involved into schools and stuff like that. Got rid, one year was one school, second year we took five small schools and did the same project. Then we got the multinational out of 15 of the schools in the urban area to bring local food and, and um, food that was being prepared on site, cook, you know, from raw ingredients. It was not all coming from local, but just the cooking part, that it was not just coming from a truck and then being put in the oven and served. So we had to teach back the culinary skills to the staff that were, you know, in those positions because the system had brought their jobs that was very uh, monotone, I don't know. Uh, bland. Bland, anyway, so we had to go, so anyway, so we got that going, and then my goal, I'm a physical education teacher, so I like to work with kids, so then I asked the school, so I started, when school had been to the, an orchard, they came back with tons of apples, and they didn't know what to do with it, so I went to the school, and I said, I'll do culinary class, so grade one, and kindergarten grade one, I did one recipe, two and three, so every second grade, 
kids loved it. So the following year, the school called back, Rachel, do you want to come back? So I said, I don't want to do the same recipe. So then I developed, so I have a continuum of eight different that we, we work with our five cents with the work five cents with the apples so we work with culinary skills so anyway so i've seen that as soon as the kids get involved and they're going to get actually it's their behavior is going to change it's not by getting big posters of the new brunswick apple or the new brunswick blueberry the big marketing just get the the food in the hands of the kids and they learn and within being in my role in the school system we're trying to change the system because students are not engaged and they're not engaged because they don't see the meaning of, so some of them, they're not engaged, they're not intellectually engaged. So we're trying to shift and we're looking forward to experiential learning. So everything that they do, they, they have, it has to relate to them in some kind of way. So in 2018, with a colleague of mine, we asked the school board, can we start a nonprofit organization, which was a second one that we were putting together. It's called Educational F um, Apprentice in Action, Educational Food Lab. So it's with, within action, how we can get the kids. So we want the kids to grow, cook, taste and appreciate food. So we've, our first step is that we've worked developing the curriculum about the cooking skills because we had lots of schools that were doing gardening but then didn't know what to do with it and it was ending up in food waste. So we started with the cooking skills so then we hired school food animators. So, and I've developed a program. So K to two, we were doing culinary arts with fruits and vegetables. Uh, three and four, it was healthy snacks. Five and six was breakfast. Seven and eight was meals. So we hired a school food animator that would go with toolkits into the school, do their program, and then leave. But it was, we were not building the capacity because they were an external resources that would show up for a day with the materials and then when they would leave, it was no capacity, so nothing was left. And then in that same time, there was a school that was just being built. So I went to the school board, I said, okay, how far are you in the plan? Can I get a room where we can do culinary skills? I get a lab going in that school. And the head of the school board said, Rachel, if you can fill in the partners, you know, we can make it happen. And then I asked who the principal was, was going to be. And the school board couldn't tell me because the position was not out. So I was thinking to myself, I can rattle all the partners that I want and get that going. But if it doesn't match with the principal's vision, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know, I, there's, I can't go anywhere. So the, the, what we've decided to do with this nonprofit organization, and I think everything happens for a reason, is that we develop toolkits for the school. So for $2,500, the school get toolkits with all of the equipments to do to get their hands into cooking and stuff like that. So right now, what I've been doing, I've been targeting the grade fives. So when I go in, I ask every school to um, get me two food ambassadors. So people apply that want to be the school food ambassador. So they get a full day workshop with me by myself before we start the class. And then we go in for, and I've choose the grade five. It was the breakfast model. So they learn how to cut uh, peel and then they, we introduce the cooking so they get like all the aspect the basic aspects of cooking so then I get those two kids come with me for a full day then once we get into the classroom I've got two pairs of eyes extra that are going around to make sure they put their hands together to cut safely and stuff like that and the ambitious is that the kids are going to be, after that, the grade fives will be going in to teach the younger kids, like the snack program and the younger kids. So they'll be empowered and they'll develop their self-confidence. And once you have to teach somebody, somebody else, you have to learn it before. So it gonna, it's going to anchor. And with this strategy is that, you know, it with the breakfast program that we do with the grade five, they learn to boil an egg, but they could transfer to 
boil pasta or potato or whatever you name it after. So anyway, that's what we've been working on and it's been stalled because I've been shift for the last two years with COVID uh, roles, but I'm getting back into it and some of the schools are, I'm going to meet with students that want to take on the role, so we're getting uh, into it. So we're, it's going to take a couple of years just to make sure that this model uh, works, but anyway, it seems positive and I'm anxious to see it, what's going to be coming up. Wow. So before we move on to questions from the floor, and who has a microphone for questions? Is there somebody? Yeah, okay, we've got a person with a microphone for questions, but first, Rachel, can I just go back to the cafeteria? So, so currently, how many cafeterias are, are under, is it, is it a nonprofit organization or? Yeah, it's, um, I work for District Scolaire Francophone Sud. Um, there's 37 schools. So there is 26 or 27 that is run under uh, Le Réseau des Cafeterias Communautaires, which is a non-profit organization that was built. So, and, so they're still going on, and all the other cafeterias are run uh, individually by the schools. So we've got uh, no cafeterias that are being run by, by multinational at the school board at all. Okay. Wow. So to put that in a little bit of context for Nova Scotia, the Auditor General's report that Lindsay Corbin referenced found that only 9% of uh, the, the third-party-run uh, cafeterias, uh, which are, are typically run by large companies, only 9% of them were uh, providing food that was in compliance with the school food and nutrition policy. And, and Lindsay and I were just in a meeting yesterday uh, with a bunch of nutritionists. Part of their job is sort of trying to keep an eye on those cafeterias. And, and they're discovering things like, and, you know, and one of, the, one of the nutritionists there, you know, has responsibility for 140-something schools, and that includes breakfast, and it includes gardens. Um, and so, like, monitoring and doing, doing um, you know, Compliance audits with cafeterias is like another thing on their on their job description, um, and they're finding things like they go into a cafeteria, and yes, there's the healthy meal, but there's there's five other things on the menu that are cheaper and actually don't comply with the school food and nutrition policy. Or we heard a story, one of the stories that we heard yesterday that just like perked my ear was, you know, a little kid going up to a uh, going up to a, a window at a cafeteria and saying, with a dollar and saying, can I buy a cookie? And the answer being, you can buy two cookies with that. And so, you know, little kid gets two cookies instead of one cookie. And, and, and so, you know, and those are the sorts of things that actually shouldn't be, shouldn't be possible to happen at that age level and, and in that kind of environment. So we have a lot of work to do and uh, Rachel, I've I've heard a little bit about you, but I've, I'm I'm super inspired by you know what you've been able to accomplish. Um, questions? Maybe we can get some. Uh, we I see one right at the back, so we'll, we, maybe we can start at the back and kind of work our way up. Thank you. Um, love fantastic work, all of you. Uh, just want to ask about any tips, tricks for <laughs> teachers. So I'm working with a middle school right now in New Brunswick, a St. John area, and. The administration is on board for doing some of these things. They actually have like their old home ec lab that they want to use. But the teachers are saying, oh my goodness, we can't give these kids knives. Oh my goodness, we can't do this with these kids. I can't manage my whole classroom. So I'm trying to find training to help them get out of the typical classroom setting. But any tips or resources, I would love to hear. Thank you. Rachel and also Lindsay, Rebecca. Yeah. Uh, I have knives when I go into the, the toolkit gets a uh, utility knife, very sharp utility knives. So we do a basic um, positioning. What you do with your right hand, your stabilizing hand, and your cutting hand. And in the last couple of years, I've never had like at first when I first went in with some kids with some knives without a proper. Uh, <laughs> 
order because you can be cooking for yourself but teaching how to cook and how to handle um, it's two different things so I had missed little accidents and stuff like that with but with this new procedure everything's been smooth and uh, also you can do there's for my in my toolkit the younger kids I've got wavy knives that are doing exactly the same trick as you know the sharp knives and they're a lot safer so you could even be starting with that and for like um, the toolkit we use induction plates so as soon as we lift the pot uh, the current is cut so on the safety wise um, it's uh, helpful yeah. no okay I, I will say and, and this is just my experience as a mom um, it's interesting what we think kids are capable of versus what they're actually capable of. I've, I've, you know, my kids have been peeling carrots and grating carrots since they were very young, and I've had visitors in my kitchen who were like, "Oh, be careful with that," you know, and they're like, "Anyhow, because 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 they're fine, they're they're fine." But it is about like having those experiences, and I'm sure for anybody who grew up on a farm or near a farm, um, there's you know, kids have lots of. Lots of abilities to develop real skills. Okay, we had another question. I'm gonna I'm gonna let the person with the mic make the choices. Um, yeah, so I was wondering about how we teach like healthy eating to children with uh, whilst also sort of rejecting diet culture and and you know like embracing body positivity because it seems like a really fine balance there. Like you know the way we do it with the Canada Food Guide and. and I have no idea how to answer that, but I have the exact same question. Um, Did everybody hear the question fine? It was like, so how to help I can repeat. Yeah, I can please. repeat the question. So the question is around how do we teach healthy eating um, while also not reinforcing diet culture and, uh, and enforcing, and instead we want to enforce, um, you know, intuitive eating and body positivity and all those things. Uh, Gosh, I mean, that's the like. I think one of the biggest challenges because I'm just thinking about um, my uh, child. I have a 13 year old, um, and their their health class recently. Uh, they just told me about it. Um, they've been learning about food, and one of the things that they had to do was track what they ate and all their physical activity. And I'm like. Are we still doing this? These are 13 year olds. Um, and I know that the teachers, you know, you want teachers to care about, like you don't want them to not care about healthy living and things like that, but there's there's a way to go about it and and that's not it. And so it's, it's very tricky. I think um, there, I, I honestly can't, couldn't put my finger on like, you know, amazing resources to do that. Um, maybe they're out there. I'd love to hear if anybody knows about them because most of what I've seen, um, yeah, it, it's it's just not quite hitting the mark. Um, it, it's not as bad as it used to be, but it's still not quite hitting the mark of that balance. Yeah, and, and I would just add to that that at Nourish, we're lucky in that our, our dietitian who is on staff now has you know, lived experience with eating disorders and brings that real sensitivity to our language and what we're putting out there. And, and part of one of the results of that are, you know, that has contributed towards the work that um, our communications team is doing now, which is actually developing a definition for healthy, which is not based on like nutritional numbers, but on, you um, and, and like literally the definition of healthy was being workshopped in a committee meeting this week. So I don't have the definition yet, but, but the ideas that were coming out was, you know, uh, healthy food makes you feel good. Healthy food gives you energy. You know, healthy food is interesting. And it, it's about like the experience and, and so much of it is about connecting with your body and connecting with, with your experience about what food enables you to do sort of in the same way that having a body enables you to go have experiences because you're, you've got strength as opposed to thinking about what the body looks like. But it's such a great question and I think a, a really important one for all of us working on food to be thinking about. So thanks for bringing that. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, everybody. This is so fascinating. I feel like I'm back in university, like surrounded by so many like-minded folks and so much energy. And uh, I'm just recently have started to uh, volunteer with an, uh, a very small market garden in River Bourgeois, just outside of St. Peter's, Cape Breton. Um, and we're super excited. And the gal who's kind of spearheading it, she's her whole goal is food security, food education for seniors, for kids, for the whole community. Um, we have a geothermal now, and we're just, this is our first winter actually was planting last weekend, hoping they'll, they'll do well. Um, so I'm, I'm curious because I, I'm hearing so many great ideas and I've been taking lots of notes, so I will be looking up all the different websites and stuff, but what would you suggest is the best route to go to try to involve students on the property. We have a big outdoor garden, we have the geothermal, we have a commercial kitchen and a former Glebe house. Like, there's tons of potential. So, do I go to the school board? Do I look at your websites? Do I, like, what would you guys suggest that I do to try to get more kids, not just the kids, but also all of the community to be able to, it's a big, big question, I know, so. <laughs> And are you thinking of it from a point of view of getting kids out to help you with what you're doing or to teach them about farming? I guess. Because it's a little both. different. Yeah, I guess if they come to the premises, yeah, I, I don't know if there's what's involved there or, or interesting if, if you go into the classroom with, with, you know, vegetables and this is what they are. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there's there's a few different ways. So there's Canadian Agricultural Literacy Month, which I talked about, where you could visit a classroom and talk about your farm story. Um, Jeanette McDonald from the Federation's here in the back of the room. So the Federation uh, helps organize Open Farm Day. So that's for the general public, not specifically schools, but you can get the general public out to your farm to learn about um, agriculture. Uh, and then if you can make a connection with a teacher, there's opportunities, um, like if there's a high school, there are their options and opportunities program uh, where they're looking for work experience for students in different areas, um, or grade nine citizenship where they, uh, may, they, have a, they have to do a volunteer project. So you could present that to the teacher as the students could come and volunteer on my farm and learn some things. There's a grade eight food and nutrition class. So if uh, you could connect it to like learn how the vegetables grow and then you can take some back and cook with them at the school. So it's, it's kind of finding what the curriculum outcomes are and then making those linkages with the teachers. Thanks. Yeah, relationships seem to be the beginning for almost everything. My question is actually like directly related to that. Um, I'm, you know, lucky enough to have graduated from high school about four years ago. I have a good connection with my former high school, so um, I work with teachers who, like, say they're doing a unit on uh, biodiversity. Then we have the students come in and they do a bio blitz on the farm and stuff like that. Um, but I know that there's lots of farmers out there who are interested in doing programs like that with teachers, and there's lots of teachers who would be interested in incorporating farmers that way, but uh, it's harder to make those connections that you're talking about. Do you think there's an opportunity for some sort of like official accessible network <laughs> for people to access that way? So yes, <laughs> that's in my... That was in our strategic plan um, for 2019 to have a sort of speakers bureau of farmers who could connect with classrooms. And, uh, uh, you know, COVID kind of messed that up. Um, so I think it's something that will be in our next strategic plan in some format. Um, it's certainly something that we're hearing from industry and, and something that we're encouraging teachers to do in, in the lesson plans and classroom resources that we provide. There is, a, I mean, it, it's a lot of work, right? So my staff is like totally at capacity right now. Um, so we're looking at ways to find efficiencies and I don't know if I'll get another staff position I'm asking. So uh, yeah, but it is, it, I agree with you that it's important um, and it is something that we, in theory we can facilitate. So uh, I'll just say stay tuned. Yeah, and I would say at Nourish, um, depending on the location, I mean, sometimes it's a bit random, like who do we have relationships with? We try to, we, we, we're basically an organization that builds a lot of relationships. Um, 
And so, and we have a farm to um, farm to cafeteria Canada part time position who's the regional lead for Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And so, reaching out to Don through our website, sort of depending on depending on where the school is and what the ask is, we might be able to help with an introduction. And sometimes, really, it's like the introduction that sparks all the possibility that come afterwards. And other, I'll just make a point. Another reality in Nova Scotia and the, the other geography is different in each of the Atlantic provinces, but around 35 to 40 percent of our schools are in HRM, um, which includes the rural parts of HRM, but like practically speaking, most of our students are not really in an area where they, they can easily get to a farm. So that's one of the main reasons uh, as well why we shifted to sending things out to schools rather than trying to get schools out to farms or events because we just can't reach all the students. Um, there's too many of them in urban areas where you know it's like at least 45 minutes if you're on the peninsula to get out to a farm. So it's not realistic for most schools to be able to do that. So. I'm not saying that to discourage you. I'm just saying, like, to have a speakers bureau or a list of farms um, that you know schools can go to. There's still going to be a ton of schools in Nova Scotia that are, just can't do it. So, yeah. Rachel had. Uh... Uh, I just want to say, in New Brunswick, on the francophone side, I'm not even sure if it's that way on the anglophone side of the education ministry in, in New Brunswick. But on the francophone side, every high school from uh, grade nine to grade 12, they get, depending on the schools, a full time, some the biggest schools got two people. It's called collaborateur vicariaire. So they link, they have the role that I was in, that was the community agent, I was linking with the community, but this new role is linking with the working world. So they're hired full time to make um, experiential, to make those connections, to bring, send the kids to the farm or to the industry or vice versa. So they have full time position. Some of them in every school, some that have two, the biggest high school have two people that are just exactly do that connection. So anyway, if there's something that the education, of, uh, they could look what's been b being developed. And it's, it was the first year last year, and we had tons of um, um, obstacle because of COVID restriction and stuff like that, because they couldn't. But right now, uh, they're really uh, looking towards that to make sure that the kids, you know, get, you know, in their real life situation, and then can have a better clear path of where they, they want to go. I see a hand here. Being in the Maritimes um, and having such a strong connection to, I guess, the other side of the food system, the ocean, uh, is there any work being done with uh, educating students on seafood and the, and the benefits of that and, you know, fishing, farming in, in the oceans? Um, it's definitely something that's being talked about at, at tables that I'm at um, because I don't think that it really is. I don't know if Hannah Nelson's in the room, but uh, anyway. She's at the conference, so she might look conference. for her. Um, yeah, she's uh, with the Nova Scotia Seafood Alliance, um, and she sits on the Coalition for Healthy School Food. Uh, so it's certainly, you know, something that we're talking about, but uh, I know I was just um, through the my connections with the National Coalition for Healthy School Food. Um, John Finn in Newfoundland shared a story of how difficult it was to get cod into a school in Newfoundland. Um, and... So yeah, it, it's it is. Uh, I mean, and that's uh, that's the food service piece, not the education about about food piece. But uh, but they did bring that that whole education about the fish uh, fish and fisheries into. Um, they they were successful in being able to to create that meal. But it certainly um, seems like it should be a no brainer. But there's al like there's challenges around allergies. Again, that's in terms of bringing the actual food in. But uh, I, I don't know all the details, but what's taught in every classroom, obviously, but it seems like a pretty huge gap. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. So I know in Nova Scotia, there's um, 
to the, some kind of salmon federation or association that will hatch salmon eggs in classrooms. So that's one thing that's going on through a, a volunteer program. Um, there was an announcement a few months ago that uh, our provincial department of fisheries is going to be developing a, a fisheries in the classroom program, similar to the agriculture in the classroom program. And we uh, do uh, touch on aquaculture a little bit. Uh, nationally, certainly aquaculture is under our mandate. Um, in Nova Scotia, we're funded through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, which is a strict no aquaculture funding um, program, so uh, we, we try and sneak it in a little bit sometimes, especially through um, partnerships that we have with the Dalhousie Agricultural Campus because they have an aquaculture program. Yeah, and a last resource that would be available to many schools, I'm not sure if there's, uh, if there's cost involved or, or not, but it's available in English and French, is uh, Ocean School, which has been developed um, with uh, Dr. Boris Vorm at uh, Dalhousie University and a collaboration with the National Film Board. Um, we met with them recently because they've been doing all this wonderful, um, all this wonderful content about oceans, um, but they actually hadn't included anything about preparing the bounty of ocean. So we're looking at, in a next round, uh, collaborating with some recipes and some food literacy elements that they could add to Ocean School. Oh, I see a, quest I see a hand up at the front. It seems like there isn't a huge lineup. If anybody else has got a question. Oh, no, okay, one yeah. at the back first. Hi, uh, my name is Kimberly. I'm with Fishing for Success in Newfoundland and Labrador. And so we have been trying to address some of that um, very empty space in educating young people about fishing and fish. And one of the biggest things I think for me is to actually get young people outside and on the water um, because the, you know, the challenge with a, a lot of the education, and this is myself as a former high school science teacher, is that... Um, the best way immediately to make the most impact is to, is to get them outside where all five senses are engaged and uh, you can make, get the biggest bang for your buck and um, really have them understand what it means to have an animal provide food for them. And all of those things that you're trying to communicate to people about food waste and um, why we need to take care of the environment can uh, come across very quickly without you having to, um, you know, provide worksheets and spreadsheets and everything to kids because they're they're right there, immersed in it. So, so we um, have been working on it very uh, diligently, and uh, but we're very small scale, and uh, so we're, I'm looking forward to talking to you guys tomorrow. Thank you. And I'm sorry when you say that you're looking forward to talking to us tomorrow. Are you on a panel discussion tomorrow? Okay, so look at your program. <laughs> All right, any last question? Other, oh, I'm sorry, I left something out that I was supposed to mention for Julia, which is that um, graphic recording of this experience is really ideally a collective effort. So if you're taking away something that landed with you, if there's something that you wrote down that just you think should be in the graphic recording of this session, or of any other session, please feel free to like grab a sticky note, grab a marker, and I, I'm imagining to stick it on a blank part of the wall. Julia's liking my, yeah, this is excellent. <laughs> You're welcome. I could keep talking and see if it can kind of evolve into interpretive dance. Um, yeah, so feel free to do that. Otherwise, any last question for these speakers? Are we gonna take an extra couple of minutes to maybe get outside? ourselves. There was a question at the front. There was, a, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, there was a question at the front. Maybe a microphone. I think, I think the, uh, one of the things that makes this kind of situation, which is a learning, a learning situation, exciting and accessible, is that there's so many passionate people here, providing the content. And it's really neat to take uh, cooking and gardening and so forth into the schools in art, in music. But we don't pay too much attention to whether 
It's being delivered by people that are truly passionate and allowed to be passionate, you know, allowed to remain passionate about what it is they're bringing to, to the situation. And um, I don't know, this is just an overall sort of philosophical thing, I think. Um, but if you want people, to, kids, <laughs> to really pay attention, to be engaged, uh, to be inspired, then, you know, it, it strikes me that starting to bring the questions of philosophy of education back into what we're, we want to deliver is worth doing. It's worth taking the time and saying, okay, how do, can we get more passionate people into the school programs? Could we have a gardener, a school gardener, a school gardener that's a professional gardener, uh, a chef that's deliver, helping everybody deliver the cooking aspect of things, you know, so that we know for sure that we're addressing the heart of the situation. Thank you. Thanks, David. Anybody want to say anything in response to that? My dream is that within the school is that we get a chef or a teacher that's engaged and then we use that opportunity of having food and having to feed people, make the most education out of it by growing it, transforming it, doing it. So that's where I would like to be in, you know, in the end is to get the kids because Inside the building of the school, there's so much potential with intergenerational, you know, in rural New Brunswick, we've got schools that are great kindergartens to grade 12. Well, how can they help, you know, within the schools and stuff like that? So, yeah, I think it's something. Yeah. And, and I'll just add that, you know, Lindsay talked about the eight. Um, principles of the, the National Coalition for Healthy School Food, which is pushing so hard for a federal investment. And I think it's precisely because the, the local assets that are in any school community are going to be a little bit different, that it's so important that there be a, there be a federal investment, but also that, that it be uh, lo adaptable and flexible and responsive to the local realities how, how you spend it. Um, and so that's been a big part of the national, national and also the provincial conversation, that it, it's not cookie cutter. Thank you, because that just reminded me. Um, there, uh, I don't know if Louise is here. Are you here, Louise? You're I think not Louise here. is not here. Um, so uh, Louise, who is on the Coalition for Healthy School Food uh, Steering Committee with me, has printed off some QR codes. So anybody in this room can fill... There is currently a government survey active, just came out last a few days, a few days ago. So if you want to have your say in um, school food in Canada... Uh, you can fill out the survey. I'll make sure that the um, QR codes get on the ta our topic table, which is in, I don't know what that the, room is called. The, the, the one the, with the, the nice dining chairs. Yes. <laughs> yes. The other side of the cafeteria. Yeah. And you could also, you know, do a search for the minister responsible who put it out, uh, Minister Karina Gould, or you could do a search for the Coalition for Healthy uh, School, School Food. Food. Um, yeah, it was launched with a bit of fanfare just on Wednesday morning. Yep. So thank you all very much for joining. Thanks, Rebecca, Rachel, and Lindsay for, for bringing content to, to this panel. Thank you. Thank you.